And we are really happy to have Derek Baxter join us for this author talk. We want to thank the Friends of the Library for making these programs possible, because without their generous support, we probably would have half the many programs, if, if even that. And I want to thank um, our partners at the Mather Homestead, who are part of this program this evening. We also have um, copies of Derek's book at the library. And let me tell you a little bit about the program. In the 1780s, Thomas Jefferson took time away from his job as ambassador to France to travel through Europe, seeing and learning as much as he could. This is the tale of Jefferson's travel advice and Baxter's journey 200 years later to travel with Jefferson in Europe. Derek Baxter graduated from the University of Virginia with a degree in history. He is currently an attorney living in Virginia. After years of research, Derek made nine separate trips abroad on Jefferson's trail. You can follow him on jeffersonstravels.com and please sit back, enjoy, and there'll be some prizes and quiz at the end. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. Okay, see you soon. Well, thank you, Ka Kathleen. Thank you. Uh, to the, thanks to the Darien Library, to the Mather Homestead, the Barrett Bookstore, to, to all of you for, for uh, attending tonight. Very excited to be here virtually and to talk to you about this journey I was on. So... Uh, so yes, this book, I, I, I wrote a book in pursuit of Jefferson, traveling through Europe with the most perplexing founding father, and it gave me a chance to explore a different side of Thomas Jefferson, one that we don't uh, probably think about or, or read about as much as some of the other periods of his life. We, we all know, you know the younger Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence at age 33, or the older Jefferson uh, as president, you know, with all his accomplishments. But this gave me a chance to learn about the Jefferson, the middle-aged Jefferson, the, the Jefferson uh, who was pushing 40, uh, the time of his life in the 1780s when he went to France. And he almost never went. He almost never got there. He was in, it was a very dark time of his life. Uh, there were two terrible events that happened that, that kind of pushed him out the door because Jefferson had, had been asked twice to be an ambassador to France and he had declined both times. He was, you know, he was very, very attached to his wife. His wife was in ill health for, for most of her married life and he didn't want to leave her side. Uh, but these two kind of terrible events happened early in the 1780s. Uh, and one was, one happened when he was the wartime governor of Virginia. You know, Jefferson, he was, he was, of course, a brilliant man, had all of these talents, but being a decisive military leader really wasn't in his skill set. Uh, during the revolution, Virginia was at first spared a lot of the fighting, uh, but the British, the British invaded in, uh, in the very end of 1780 and then into 1781, and Governor Jefferson really had, a, had trouble calling up the militia he, he was trying to get the militia to, you know, to leave their farms and, and, and stay in, in the field. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't able to do it. The British overran the state. They almost caught him, too. Uh, British dragoons charged up Monticello Mountain, came within minutes of arresting him. Uh, he escaped. He fled through the woods. What else was he supposed to do? But his political enemies just tore into him, and they, 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 they called his actions disgraceful and even hinted at cowardice. And Jefferson was just stung by the criticism. He was a bit thin-skinned, and he wrote uh, that he retired. He was done with politics. He said he, he had retired to his field, his farms, and his family, which he would leave uh, nevermore. Uh, and that might have been it. And people, at, even at the time, didn't know everything about Jefferson that we know today. It wasn't well known, for example, that he wrote the Declaration of Independence. That fact at the time, that was still kind of kept under wraps. The idea was to present the Declaration as this work of, of the entire Continental Congress. So his political star had pretty much crashed. But that wasn't the worst of it. It was the next year, 1782, when his wife Martha died following a very difficult childbirth. And Jefferson wrote that he was in a stupor. He was as dead to the world as now his, his late wife was. And he even wrote to one French friend, he was even, even hinting at suicide. So Jefferson was just in a very bad place. And that's when his friend, James Madison, realized that what Jefferson most needed was a change of scenery. So he arranged 
for the Congress to give Jefferson a third chance to go at going to Europe. And this time he accepted. He needed to get out of there. And it was in Paris, I think, that he, he found himself. But to get there, uh, and this is interesting, I think, uh, for us all tonight, he, he traveled. The Congress was meeting in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, that was the capital for a short period of time. Uh, Jefferson needed to take a ship out of Boston to, to get to, uh, to France. And he did so. He traveled. He, purpose, he could have sailed all the way from Annapolis to Boston, but instead he just went to New York and then went overland so he could explore the area. So he went right through Darien on his way to France. He, he traveled from Stanford to Fairfield. And all the while, you know, Jefferson, just curious, was trying to learn about uh, all you know, about the Northeast. He had never been north of, of New York City before. Uh, so, and he, he didn't have a lot of time, so he made contacts with people and asked them to send him notes, uh, especially on the commerce of New England um, and the Northeast, because this was something that he, would, he needed to know as an ambassador. So he learned all about Connecticut among other states. He learned about what carpenters were paid and what the, the biggest industries were and uh, how many jobs there were for fishermen. And one of his uh, informants there, he asked about the government. One of his informants told him in 1784, uh, the government of Connecticut is very much respected. There being, uh, it being energetic, sufficiently energetic to carry the laws fully into execution. I don't know if Connecticut, the Connecticut government has ever gotten such a, a, a ringing endorsement, um, but it did when Jefferson was there. So, uh, so he got all this information. He went to Paris, and there he really came into his own. Uh, this is Jefferson uh, uh, when he sat for a painting in France. So you can tell he's gone French. He's got the lace ruffles. He's surrounded by artwork. Uh, he just fell in love with Paris, which, of course, was the, the capital of the Enlightenment. He went to intellectual salons, uh, made, you know, court, you know, talked with the great scientists and writers of the day, learned all about art, went to the Louvre many times, heard music all the time, uh, and got out of this deep depression that he was in and learned all sorts of things. So he was able to take, along with his, his duties as ambassador, Jefferson was able to find the time to travel, which is what he really loved. And he took three long trips outside of Paris. Uh, you can see some of, the, some of these in, in these maps. Um, he went up to Amsterdam. He went uh, on one trip where he met up with John Adams and uh, did some business, but then traveled around through Germany. He took a separate trip to the south of France and Italy. And he took a third trip, uh, again, meeting up with John Adams to England. Uh, he did some business in London and then traveled around the English countryside. So uh, it was in 1788, um, as Kathleen mentioned, uh, he, at, at the beginning, uh, he wrote a, a travel guide of sorts. So two young Americans showed up in Paris. These were 20-something uh, young gentlemen who were sons of uh, political leaders back home, of acquaintances of Jefferson from the States. Uh, and they were getting ready to, to go out on the grand tour to travel all through Western Europe. And so who better to ask for travel advice than their ambassador, uh, Jefferson? So they asked him, where should they go? What should they do? And Jefferson, being Jefferson, the ultimate overachiever, he, he didn't just uh, you know, jot down a few addresses of hotels and give them a couple of ideas. He instead wrote this 5,000 word letter to them that was essentially a guide. It wasn't published, but it was um, it was definitely detailed enough to take them all around Europe for for over a year. And he called it "Hints to Americans Traveling Through Europe." So, uh, flash forward a couple of centuries later, uh, and um, and I was thinking about uh, following this travel guide. Uh, I had always looked up to Jefferson. You know, I grew up here in Virginia, um, you know, really admiring him, respecting him, and saw him as this Renaissance man, the kind of brainy founder who could do anything. Uh, so I was pushing 40 at the time, and I, I saw a couple of parallels. I don't want to make too much of it, but I, I saw a couple of parallels. I was almost exactly the same age as Jefferson was when he went to Europe, and I also felt like 
I was kind of missing something, some big challenge, and I came across this guide and I became very interested in it. And I think one thing that captivated me too was it wasn't just uh, it wasn't it wasn't a vacation. Jefferson didn't really do vacations. He he put out you know he was making people do homework on these travels. So these were uh, these these are the the eight subjects that he asked the young men to investigate while they were out on the road. A whole lot of a uh, whole lot of issues to look into: agriculture, mechanical arts, manufacturers, landscape gardens, architecture, painting and statuary. Uh, politics and royal courts. Uh, so he really wanted them to learn about these subjects uh, because, you know, our country had just started out. We, you know, it was in an economic depression. The, uh, it was the constitution uh, was just in the process of being ratified. So we were just setting up some of our institutions. And he really felt that Europe had some useful things to, to, uh, to offer Americans. Um, but not just good things. He also wanted us to look closely and critically and figure out what we should not just uh, copy from Europe. So here are a few subjects and I'm gonna move into, actually a, bit, a little early, I'm gonna move into the quiz part of our program to see how well you know Thomas Jefferson. So we're gonna see, uh, so I've got a few questions here and if you can type in your answer in the chat. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is give away uh, a nice map of, Jeff of Jefferson's travels, similar to those maps I just showed you, uh, and I'll talk about how we can, how I'll get you the map later. So here's the first question. Of these different subjects, Jefferson wrote that one in particular was worth great attention for Americans. So which, which subject do you, did, do you think he thought was worth great attention? was quite interested in politics, but that was actually not the one he said was worth great attention. Um, we have, I saw agriculture, I saw landscape architecture, um, and from Francine, and that, and the answer is architecture. So I think, I think we've got a winner. Um, um, okay, so the next one. I'll go back to the screen. Can you all see that again? Um, Okay, the next question. Jefferson thought this subject uh, was just too expensive. He thought it would be, quote, useless and preposterous for an American to try to learn about this subject. Painting and statuary is the correct answer. And, and, and I'll talk more, I, I actually have a passage on this in the book about how Jefferson at first thought it was just a waste of time. And by the end of his stay in, uh, in Europe, he actually was a little more interested and actually wound up buying a bunch of paintings and, and statues. But he did think that painting and statuary, he thought that Americans kind of had to had to pick, you know, pick our poison, kind of figure out which which arts we could at that point in our history really focus on. And he thought painting was in statues were just out of the question. Last one. Um, what subject did Jefferson recommend learning about? But saying you should learn about this only because it will teach you about, quote, the weakest and the worst part of mankind. And the answer is royal courts. Um, royal courts, yes. Jefferson was terrified that these young Americans would actually enjoy themselves at the courts and come back. And of course, it, you know, establishing an aristocracy or a monarchy here was just, it was just you know, his worst nightmare. So Jefferson wanted them to look at royal courts, but basically just you know, not enjoy themselves while they did that. So, uh, so moving on, moving back to, you know, to my story, I decided that it, it, it would be really interesting, you know, a great challenge to, go, to just take this guide book and go out and do the trips myself. But I did see, you know, I, I saw a few obstacles to it. You know, I had a full-time job. I, I had uh, two small kids. I couldn't just pick up and, you know, backpack around Europe like, like I, you know, did back in college. So I kind of had to, I, 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 was, I, I was a little torn once I had this great idea. And I was thinking about just what would it look like to take this guide and how would I connect with people and what would Jefferson's guide really be relevant? And I guess one place that really did give me pause. So I'm going back to the map here uh, is Bordeaux. You can see Bordeaux in the uh, the corner, it's in Southwest France, the corner 
the bottom right hand corner of the map. If you know anything really about wine at all, I'm sure you know that Bordeaux is one of the most, if not the most exclusive wine regions in the world. So this is a, you know, extremely fancy place. So Bordeaux, Jefferson loved Bordeaux. It was one of the highlights of his trip. He wrote on and on about it in his guide, which I found fascinating because he wasn't, uh, you know, Jefferson was a very serious guy. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was thinking to myself, why was Jefferson so interested in wine? Um, and I'll read you, I'll read you just a, a few paragraphs from the book. Uh, Jefferson's travels through southern France formed part of his quest for the perfect bottle of wine. This wasn't just so he could lay out the best table in America, although he would do that too. Until independence, Americans had drunk only rough, overly sweet Madeira, forced on them by the English and their restrictive trade policies. Now the wines of France were open to American importers. But which ones were the best? There were no printed guides. Jefferson would have to make discoveries for himself. The grapes he selected might even be grown back in America. Jefferson worried that the fastest growing drink in popularity back home was corn whiskey. He didn't want his beloved Yaleman farmers going on benders. He imagined them sipping fine yet affordable wines by the fire at night, reading Virgil in the original Latin and discussing democracy. So Jefferson rambled through the vineyards, as he put it, talking to vintners, observing winemaking and finding deals. He recorded how women plucked snails off the grapes and how men grafted vines. He bought vine cuttings to experiment with in his garden and bottles to sample at home. These were the happiest days of his life, he wrote later. After his trip, Jefferson would use his rankings of Bordeaux to guide his purchases, which he made directly with the winery wherever possible. Middlemen in in inevitably cheated the consumer, he wrote, adulterating wine, switching vintages and producers and storing it poorly. Only the producer itself provided the genuine article for it would be suicidal for them to do otherwise. He would travel home from France with 363 bottles in tow, mostly white Bordeaux. And that was just for his immediate use. The rest of his vast wine collection was shipped in crates. So I learned you know, that wine was important to Jefferson. He loved it aesthetically. He liked it as a potential crop for Americans to grow just on so many different levels. Uh, but I was scratching my head, how could I go to Bordeaux? It's not like some wineries in the US that you can make an appointment or show up you know, at a tasting room. You know, it's, it really caters to a very, very exclusive clientele. But then I found out that uh, there was a way in. So uh, once a year uh, in, in the fall, Bordeaux hosts a, a marathon. So all these wineries, you run through the wineries and they open their doors. And so for a pretty modest registration fee, you can go into all these wineries. Um, and not only that, uh, you know, so I, I can make these Jeffersonian connections, go to some of the exact wineries you went to, but there are a couple of catches. One is that you have to drink wine as you go. The wineries are giving you small little glasses of wine. And the other one is that you have to run in costume. So, uh, but I decided I was in. And so actually this is, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this talk tonight because the anniversary of this race is tomorrow. Tomorrow is the 10th anniversary. It was September 8th, 2012. I decided to go for it. Uh, the theme, they have a different theme and, and the theme that year was history. So I figured dressing as Jefferson wouldn't look that weird. Uh, so there I am with my wife in the middle of the marathon. We're actually running the marathon, although you might not necessarily know it, but that is in the middle of the marathon at one of the many stops. And I'm gonna read you one more passage from the book. Um, the book is kind of half history, half travel. So the part I read before was a little more focused on Jefferson. This part is more focused on my experiences following him. It's, this is at the very end of the race. And, and there are a couple of things to tell you before I read this passage. One is uh, it was a real hot marathon and we are suffering and just trying to finish it. And we were trying to stay above these three runners called the sweepers. They sweep you out of the race. If you fought, they are running at the slowest possible pace you can do and still complete the marathon on time. So if you're behind them, they'll just sweep you out. And the second thing, just a bit of context, which I talk about before I get to this passage in the book is, um, is about Jefferson's uh, private secretary, William Short. Uh, he was one of the young men who followed the trip. Uh, he joined up with the other two men en route 
Um, he was a Virginia lawyer and he was going through a bit of a crisis, maybe a little like I was at the time too. So I'll get to that in the short reading. By now, the small sips of Bordeaux no longer dull the throbbing in our knees or the blistering on our feet. And even the mild whiny buzz has disappeared. Ale, Liana, call out the spectators who look concerned. Her name is on her running bib, but I wonder why she is garnering such attention. Then I see that she's as bright red as a nice Cabernet Sauvignon. Despite all the pageantry and wine, it is still a marathon, our first, and doubts about this whole expedition creep in. How would it bode for any plans of following hints to Americans if we fail on this inaugural leg? We walk briskly. I know we're north of six hours into the race, closing in on the seven hour limit. A tent with a flag proclaiming, proclaiming kilometer 38 is a welcome sight. We're on the home stretch and it's time for the most famous stop on the journey, a table piled high with heaps of mottled oysters. A man with a proud white mustache and sun brown arms shucks them at a snail's pace. I drink white sauterne poured from a plastic water bottle. It tastes different from everything we've had before. Tropical, like lychees and passion fruit. Jefferson loved this sweet wine so much, he would order it his whole life, sending bottles to George Washington as a present. The lush sauterne almost puts me in a trance. If only I could lie down, stop running and drink some more, preferably listening to sitar music. I reach my hand out for seconds. Liana shouts to me from the edge of the tent. I can't hear her, but manage a gallic shrug, smile weakly and take another swig. Liana looks upset as if she had eaten a bad oyster and points dramatically at a hill as if to say, j'accuse. I follow her finger. High, cresting a distant hilltop 100 meters ahead of us, run the three sweepers. Behind them, a gaggle of runners practically cling to the trio's capes, begging for penance. The sweepers and their acolytes disappear over the hill, crushing the juice from our dreams. We're about to be placed in the van and hauled back to the starting line. My hints test run a failure. On Monday, I'll be back on the commuter train, getting to work by nine for another week of sameness. Just like those Bordeaux wines, I'll be confined in a classification that's impossible to break out of. My mind flashes to Jefferson. Am I really gonna be leaving him so soon? I think about William Short and the advice he sought from his mentor. He too traveled to Bordeaux with a troubled mind, torn about his own future. Should he remain in Paris long-term or follow his dream of running for office back home? He was afraid that if he chose wrong, he'd have to resign himself to a life he hadn't wanted. Consider carefully, Jefferson counseled in a return letter, he would be sorry to lose Short as his secretary, but the young man had to find his own path to durable happiness. It won't be easy. It will certainly involve hard work. This is not a world in which heaven rains riches into any hand that will open itself, Jefferson wrote. Whichever of these courses you adopt, delay is loss of time. The sooner the race is begun, the sooner the prize will be obtained. Merle, I feel an almost electric jolt course through me. I'm not ready to abandon this race, this prize, this pursuit of happiness. Without a word, Liana and I rush forward, revolutionary storming the barricades. We put pain out of mind. We charge up the hill, sweeping past the sweepers. On a runner's high, blisters and heat forgotten, we clock our fastest kilometer as the Grand Gironde River comes into sight. My cape flies crisp in the wind, our hearts pound in unison, our minds drag our exhausted bodies behind them. Ale Liana, she's purple like Merlot and determined. Loud French music blares, people clock. The clock ticks seven hours. We cross the line holding hands. We finish the marathon. Now the hard journey begins. So the, the race was a success. It was a lot of fun. We did feel, I did feel like I made some connections to history and I did vow to, to continue on this trip but I basically broke it into segments. And over the course of eight years, uh, I went back and, and did different parts of the trip. So this is a scene from Amsterdam on a, a festival called King's Day. And this is where 
the travel guide begins. It starts in Amsterdam. And uh, I, I use this trip as a real way to, to learn how Jefferson liked to travel. Because he put a lot of travel advice in this guide. And I think, I think a bunch of it does stand the test of time even today. So basically, Jefferson said, if you're traveling to a city or town you've never been to before for the first time, uh, the first thing he recommended doing was, well, to buy a map and to buy a, a, a book, which makes perfect sense. Although both of those things were, were, were pretty new at the time. This, as I said before, this is the time of the grand tour when young men, mostly you know, white gentlemen of means, uh, were traveling through Europe. And <clears throat> there were, the tourism industry had just grown up and was catering to them. So for one of the first times, you could actually go into a city and get a guidebook. And once he had that practical information, Jefferson said, go to the highest place you can find, uh, maybe a church steeple, maybe city walls, but look down and get a bird's eye view. So it's kind of like getting uh, you know, a Google Earth satellite photo today, get, get a sense of the lay of the land so you know where you're going to go. And then he wrote, quote unquote, gulp down culture. So he liked to go out and just hit all the sites and see everything he could in the first day he was there. But he said, you know, it was almost, he, he, he did have kind of a carpe diem approach. You know, he, he wrote, if you're debating whether you should go, you know, see a particular site or not, you know, think to yourself, you might never come back this way again. So don't leave with, with any regrets. But then he also said, look for balance. You know, you can't see everything. Uh, if you go to a museum, don't, don't try to see every, every piece, you know, every, every exhibit. It'll just burden your mind with trifles. So just, just pick out what you, what you think you really want to do. And once you've gulped down your culture, Jefferson said, then go out and make sure you get a real sense of the place and try to connect with real people. So he liked doing that by going to markets. He recommended going to public markets. You can buy something, you know, haggle a little bit and just talk to people and find out uh, you know, a little bit, you know, get a sense of how they really lived. And then, of course, this is my favorite piece of his travel advice, uh, Jefferson liked to drink local. He didn't actually use that phrase, but he did say in his guide, uh, you know, in a, if you're in a tavern, don't try to buy something, don't, don't buy a foreign drink. He, he thought it would just be marked up, probably wouldn't be the real thing anyway, just drink what everybody else is having. So armed with this travel advice, we started off, you know, as I said, over eight years, we, uh, we did a lot of trips. I tried to, I tried to kind of restrict each trip to one of the themes, uh, one of the objects of attention that I showed you earlier, so I wouldn't get overwhelmed. So this is England, Stowe House. The, the real theme that Jefferson emphasized in England was landscape gardening. So that's where, where I went as well with the family. Um, Jefferson really saw gardening as a key art. He, it, you know, is probably a bigger deal even back back then in the 18th century than today. Uh, and he thought this was a great, a great art for Americans to explore. You know, we had all this nature in America. He thought all you had to do was cut out the super abundant plants and there you'd have a garden. Of course, it's a lot harder than that. But Jefferson took a lot of ideas from la of landscaping back to Monticello. And if you ever visit Monticello, you'll see some of them in practice about how, uh, about the vista he has and about he, how he contrasts woods at the base of the mountain with, with, uh, with pastures laid out on the top. Another theme, and this was actually, this was much more popular, especially with my kids, than the landscape gardening subject was, uh, was food. So when Jefferson went to Italy, he wrote he was on a continued feast, and, and we were as well. This is, this is, we're stopping in an artisanal pasta factory near Naples. Where, uh, where we're learning all about the, the, the practices, some of which hadn't changed all that much since Jefferson's time, some of which had been updated. Jefferson actually acquired a macaroni maker uh, very close by from Naples as well. And he brought, he wasn't necessarily the first person to, to have pasta in America, but he, he did help popularize it. He, it was served in the president's house when he was president uh, and surprised a lot of diners. One guest was couldn't figure out what he was eating. He thought, he thought the pasta might have then elongated onions. So they just, people just weren't used to it. Uh, Jefferson also turned to a bit of a life of crime 
while he was in Italy, he was very interested in the type of rice that was being grown. He realized that Italian rice from the Piedmont from near M Milan um, sold much better in France than American rice from the Carolinas did. And he was trying to figure out why. And he, and he realized when he traveled there and went to some rice farms, he found out it was a different kind of rice. He was very excited to bring some back to the US, but he found out it was a crime to export the rice unprocessed. They wanted to protect their trade secret. And, and it wasn't just any crime. The penalty was the death penalty. But um, Jefferson was not deterred and he stuffed his pockets full of this rice and brought it back over the Alps. And I guess, you know, I'll give you a spoiler alert. He was not in fact caught and executed. He sent the rice back and the planters in South Carolina said, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we're just perfectly fine with the kind of rice that we have. Jefferson was also very interested in, in science. He wrote that science never appears so beautiful as when applied to the uses of human life. Uh, and so he's looking at practical applications of, of science, including in the fishing and whaling industries. Those were big industries for America and both industries he was trying to promote in France as a diplomat. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, he was very interested in fishing and whaling in New England. It took a lot of notes about that. Uh, so that was one of the, I think, kind of one, one of the accomplishments he had as a diplomat actually was opening up the French market to, to uh, fish oil, whale oil. Um, but finally, I think of all the subjects, you know, I said this in the, in the giveaway, the one that was really worth bright attention was architecture. Jefferson, you know, loved, uh, loved the classical architecture he saw in, uh, in Europe. And this is a drawing, um, of the first Monticello. So this is how Monticello looked before Jefferson went to Paris. And you can tell uh, it looks nothing like the Monticello you might have seen in person. You probably, I'm sure you've seen on the back of a nickel at some point. Uh, it's nothing like it. It's because he, he, he designed the first Monticello from books of architecture written by Palladio, the great Renaissance architecture, but it was all just from, from drawings. And when Jefferson got to Europe, he saw all sorts of new styles. Uh, so you can see this building looks a lot closer to the Monticello we all know. This is the Hotel de Salm in Paris. It was a private residence that was being constructed uh, almost exactly the, during the, the same years that Jefferson lived there. So he saw it being built from start to finish. And Jefferson wrote that he would go from his house on the Champs-Élysées, go down to the Tuileries Garden and sit on a lawn chair and just look across the Seine and watch this building being constructed. And he'd go home, he wrote, with, with a neck ache because he was craning his neck all day to try to figure out what they were doing. So Jefferson really loved the, the, this new uh, trendy architecture in Paris, French neoclassicism. Uh, it emphasized more modest architecture, uh, not so ostentatious. So uh, <clears throat> they loved the use of light, skylights. They loved domes. Jefferson brought all these ideas back home. And they also, you know, the French architects of the time like to make these, these, you know, huge mansions appear like they were more modest, even single story dwellings. So Jefferson took that idea. If, if you look at Monticello, especially from a distance, it looks like it might just be one story. But if you get up really close, you can tell it is in fact three stories. Jefferson took all these ideas back. He hid the third floor behind a balustrade. And then he put the second floor windows of Monticello uh, very, very, very low, right, right on the bottom of the second floor. So it looks like it could be part of the first floor. Here I am um, in Carrara in Italy, which is the source of the finest marble in the world. Jefferson got some from Carrara. Uh, he, he asked these young travelers when they stopped, when they're following his guide to stop in Carrara and and commission for him a, a, a marble a chimney piece for Monticello. So Jefferson learned how to use, you know, uh, you know, building elements uh, like Carrara marble, but you know, that's very expensive and very hard to do. So back in Virginia, he, he incorporated everything. <clears throat> he did use a, some of the marble, but he also used brick because what we have in Virginia is a lot of red clay and you know, uh, bricks kind of became part of the signature 
uh, look of Jefferson's buildings. This is obviously Monticello and you can see how he took ideas, uh, but he didn't just copy buildings he saw in Paris or in Italy. He, you know, he, he had all these ideas, he started to play around with them and come up with his own and kind of melded them together into this form of neoclassical architecture that's obviously so important uh, today. You know, you see it all over DC, you see it in many uh, other buildings that Jefferson designed in Virginia. But I think of all the different subjects, you know, that, that I did explore, you know, on the trip, you know, they're, they're, they're all meaningful. We learned a lot, had a lot of fun doing it. But, but one thing kept tugging at me and, and, and seemed like it was a big gap. It was the subject that Jefferson never wrote about in the sky, which of course is the subject of slavery uh, and, you know, and the lives of the enslaved people back at Monticello. So he didn't, he didn't write about that even though he in fact, uh, in his guide went to the major slaving ports uh, in France where slave ships were leaving all the time uh, and continuing the slave trade. Um, as I researched more and more, I became more and more troubled and you know, disturbed by by Jefferson's involvement, involvement in slavery. Of course, I knew I, I knew about this before. It's, it's it's no secret and shouldn't be. But I had I think at the first at the beginning of my trip, maybe somewhat naively, I had thought, okay, I'm you know I'm I'm writing about Jefferson the traveler, not about Jefferson the slave owner. But but I did come to realize that they they're 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 intertwined because all of those subjects that I was so excited to learn about, um, architecture, the landscape gardening, the agriculture, of course, all these projects, Jefferson had big dreams for them back home. And it was not him that was building the buildings and planting the crops. It was, it was the enslaved people at Monticello and his other three plantations. Jefferson owned over 600 people in his lifetime. He only uh, legally freed 10 of them. And as I researched more and more, you know, at a granular, at a daily basis of what Jefferson was doing in Europe, I realized it was, in fact, it was slavery, of course, that was his major income source. It was the tobacco being grown back home. And when Jefferson fell in debt and he great, his debts greatly increased while he was in Europe, he turned to enslave people for the money and to even, he even sold people. He sold 31 people in 1785 to help to help pay uh, to help pay off his debts, so it was it was a sad subject. But it was as I learned more about it, I realized I also needed to uh, and wanted to learn about all of the lives of the other people that didn't get to go on the fancy you know trip uh, that Jefferson did. This is uh, Isaac Granger, an enslaved tinsmith and blacksmith at Jefferson. And so for a while in the book. Uh, I kind of, uh, I, I, I put Jefferson aside for a little bit and, and explore the lives of some of the other people and their own travels from Monticello. Uh, this is a fascinating story, uh, I think, of Peter Fawcett. Uh, Peter was, uh, was only 11 when Jefferson died. He was part of the Hemings family. So that I mentioned that there were 10, 10 people free. They were all members of the Hemings family. Uh, and his father, Joseph Fawcett, was a member of the family and was actually one of those 10. But Peter wasn't freed. Uh, 130 people were, were auctioned off uh, when Jefferson died. And uh, Peter's life changed quite a bit. He was sold to a master who was, I think, particularly harsh, who, who whipped him, forbade him to read. Uh, so he had a, 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 a very difficult childhood after that. His, his father, with the help of some friends, eventually was able to purchase his freedom. And Peter uh, moved to Ohio and became a pastor, he ran a successful catering business, and he worked on the Underground Railroad. So he had just a fascinating and, and rich life uh, in freedom. And he had left, as I said, as, as a child, he was auctioned off on, on, from Monticello's West Lawn. He was invited back by the Levy family, which is a fascinating story in its own right, which I probably don't have time to go into. Uh, the Jewish family, the, the, uh, the family of the, the, the first Jewish uh, Naval Commodore in the US Navy, uh, who admired Jefferson for his commitment to religious freedom and owned Monticello at the, at the time. They, they, they invited Peter back uh, and Fawcett, you know, he walked through the front doors of Monticello. So uh, I really, I really, I think, grew as I learned about all these other stories on Monticello, but I did come back to Jefferson too, uh, for all his shortcomings, for all the disappointments that he didn't live up to his words in the Declaration of Independence. He still did have so many things to offer uh, in so many different fields. Uh, I was fascinated by his commitment to science, 
uh, and also to religious freedom. And of course, it was it was the letter to uh, the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut, where Jefferson set out as president, set out some of the most important words in our history about religious freedom. Uh, and, and that commitment, I think, even grew in Europe. So I, I learned a lot about Jefferson and saw him differently by the end. Um, and if nothing else, I certainly saw him as a tremendous travel guide. So with that, I'm happy to stop and take any questions you may have. But we do have some questions that people called in this afternoon. Uh, and it says, could you tell, tell us a bit about what Jefferson actually brought back from his travels besides wine? <laughs> uh, sure, there's a ton of wine. I mean, physically, he brought back, I think he had uh, something like 83 crates worth of goods on the ship coming back. So he, so he, Jefferson went home after five plus years in Europe at the end of 1789. He thought he was only gonna stay for six months or a year. He wanted to put his affairs in order. Really, he wanted to check up on the plantation, bring his daughters back home and pay off his creditors. And he, he, he wanted to return for another year or two. So he left half of his stuff back in Paris. He, he, was, he really liked to buy things. Um, so he had many, many things that he physically brought back with him. Uh, he brought a pear tree back with him and there were harpsichords and just, and so many books. Of course, uh, Jefferson wrote that he would basically every afternoon he had off from his work, he would just wander around Paris and buy up as many books as he as he could, especially anything to do with with the Americas. You know, so he he brought up he he, you know he he built up this amazing library that became the nucleus of the Library of Congress uh, later on. So he brought back all these physical uh, physical things for sure, but he also brought back I think some ideas. I talk in the book about you know about about a bunch of different about uh, some of his intellectual development as he traveled through Europe. And one of them, one of the ideas too, was he, he witnessed the growth of this kind of proto-political party in France. You know, he was there at the very beginning of the French Revolution uh, when Lafayette was, uh, you know, was the leader of, of kind of a, the more moderate faction. This is way before the guillotines came out and all. Um, and Jefferson was very involved behind the scenes and was helping Lafayette with his with what was called the Patriot Party. So I think he brought back a lot of, of those ideas later that he put into practice in the US. Um, someone asked, uh, how did Jefferson acquire such, a sophist such, such sophisticated tastes and where was he, where did the wealth come from that allowed him to live this lifestyle? Sure, but I mean, both great questions. How did he, uh, yeah, he, Jefferson, uh, you know, he grew up on what was kind of the frontier in Virginia there. If you've ever been to Monticello, uh, Jefferson's boyhood home is just, I think, about three, two or three miles away from Monticello, Shadwell. Um, it was very modest. Um, his, his mother, his, his father uh, wasn't, was, was, was wealthy, but not that wealthy. His mother was, was from one of the real landed families. In Virginia, but where he got his taste, I think it was in Williamsburg, where he went to William and Mary, uh, which I hate to say as one of my rivals, having gone to the University of Virginia. But uh, it was there at William and Mary uh, that he he connected with with a, a couple of professors who were really part of the Enlightenment, and with the the British governor, Governor Fauquier, who was who was also you know uh, had that Enlightenment tradition. They would play, he would play in a quartet with them. Uh, he devoured books. I think that's re really where he started to expand his horizons. But, um, but, but how, how he could still come from, uh, you know, come from not the wilderness, but fairly close to the wilderness to, uh, you know, feeling at ease in all these intellectual salons in Paris. It was a, it was a, a a, a great jump, but but he managed to do it. Um, so that was part of the question: where did he get the taste and, uh, and the wealth? Um, he, uh, you know, Jefferson inherited uh, ownership of a number of enslaved people from his family. He did not purchase many slaves in his lifetime. He mostly he had inherited them. Uh, so it, it was a lot. It was inherited wealth, and the wealth came from. 
you know, primarily from tobacco plantations. He had several of them, you know, mm -hmm. he, had, he owned thousands of, his father gave him thousands of acres. Um, so yeah, that, that was the primary source. He also depended on his government salaries as a diplomat and later, um, you know, president and vice president, uh, but, but, but it was primarily through agriculture and through the work of the enslaved people. Um, here's a question that touches a little bit on the slavery issues. It says Jefferson had a chef who he sent to Europe to train for a few years. How did that gentleman fare in the world of slavery on his return? Well, this is a this is a it's a difficult story. It's a painful story. James Hemings, uh, uh, James Hemings, who was who was Jefferson's uh, who was the half the half brother of of Jefferson's wife. Um, he, he brought James over to attend to him and to eventually train as a chef. And he trained at, uh, in, at, at, at the Chateau of Chantilly. You know, this is one of the most exclusive, the fanciest places you could possibly learn at one of the greatest chefs uh, there was in France. So he was highly trained and he served as the cook there in, in Jefferson's mansion. He, pro it, he apparently struck a bargain with Jefferson. Both James and Sally Hemings uh, could have stayed in France and claimed freedom the, if they had gone through the French courts as some other uh, Africans, African-Americans uh, did it, you know, uh, Blacks in Paris did at the time. Uh, he, he apparently struck a bargain that he would, he would, uh, he would train somebody else in, uh, in, these, in these culinary skills and he'd get his freedom. And that's what happened. Uh, James trained his younger brother, Peter, uh, who later passed on some of the skills to other enslaved chefs, Edith Fawcett, some other people. Uh, so they carried this tradition on for decades. Uh, and James did get his freedom. Uh, his, his life, he, he died young. He died in Baltimore. Some think it was suicide. It was, he had trouble, he had difficulty navigating, uh, navigating the, mm. the life of a free Black, which was extremely hard as you might imagine in America at the time. And there was even a bit of a falling out with Jefferson where Jefferson asked him to return to, to be a chef in the president's house. He wanted James's cooking. Uh, Hemings was felt somewhat offended that Jefferson sent this word through an intermediary, through, through a white person. He didn't want to write to him directly. James Hemings took it as a bit of an insult. And he said, no because of that. But James Hemings didn't have the life that he probably deserved to have the freedom. Yeah, wow. Um, someone asked, uh, understanding uh, Jefferson's love of wine, did he ever have a vineyard in America? Yes, he tried, he tried. Um, he tried and was not successful. He, Jefferson bought wine cuttings from all over Europe as he traveled. He got Riesling grapes, he, he brought all this wine back with him. Uh, and he and he he planted a, a Monticello. There's no record though, and he kept meticulous records. There's no, there's no record of a successful wine of wine production. And I talk about this a bit in the book. Why? I mean, the the major reason. I mean, there are many reasons. You know, the weather, the kinds of grapes, the knowledge. But the main one is uh, <clears throat> European vines are not resistant to this mm -hmm. this louse phylloxera. Uh, we have this pest in America that that uh, native grapes here, American grapes can withstand, European rootstock can't. So today, all of these, you know, European grapes like, you know, Chardonnay and whatnot that are grown here are actually European grapes that are grafted onto American uh, roots. So Jefferson, obviously nobody had any idea about this. It would be another century or so before people figured it out. So, yeah. uh, so he was not successful, but he's seen sometimes as the father of American viticulture because you know, because he loved wine so much. He popularized it. He kept buying wine his whole life. I love when, when James Monroe was elected president, you know, after Madison, Jefferson, you know, as presidents do, he wrote him, uh, ex-presidents do, he wrote him a long letter congratulating him. About the first paragraph was, was kind of, was congratulating him. And the rest of this letter was all about wine and which wines Monroe should buy and what he should serve on different occasions. So, uh, so Jefferson loved it. That's great. Um, let's see, what, um, which, which were the best places to travel for you and for Mr. Jefferson? Um, yeah, so, so many, so many. Uh, you know, Jefferson, obviously, as I've, I've said a few times, he, 
He loved Paris. He loved the south of France. Um, he thought Aix-en-Provence uh, was was just just a highlight. Uh, he loved Italy, although he only made it into northwestern Italy. He didn't really have time to explore any further, which which I know he also would have loved to have done. For me, uh, I think I think the highlights of the trip. You know, we 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 all loved Paris and Amsterdam and Milan and you know these big cities that Jefferson named. But it was really the out of the way places that we never would have thought to have gone to. One sticks in my mind, it's a little town called Seorge in the French Alps. And Jefferson really pumped up Seorge. He said like, this is the most picturesque place you'll ever see, like fall down and worship at its site. So I had to go there It's because it's, it's this little village, everything's made out of stone. It's practically clinging as Jefferson wrote to the mountainside. You know? And so houses go on for three stories. Uh, because everything's you know at an angle, and so people live on a bottom story, and the middle story, and the top story. So we spent a couple of days there, just walking around the Alps and staying in this tiny town. And it was like little out of the way places like that uh, that I loved. Um, and 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 there were so many of them. Um, but yeah, we had a we had just just about everywhere. We you know was was just a great you know great things to discover. That sounds great. We have a question that just came in. Did he also achieve polish by emulating the tastes of wealthy Northerners, such as the Adams, father and son, et cetera? Yeah, I don't know if he, uh, well, so he, uh, so when Jefferson showed up uh, in Paris, um, it was kind of a dream team of ambassadors. It was Benjamin Franklin, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. I mean, I think we were well represented there in Paris uh, until Adams, Franklin went home and, and Adams went to London. Uh, I think Jefferson probably emulated Franklin a little bit more uh, in terms of Franklin's connections to the salons, but Jefferson and Adams at the time were, were close friends. This was at the height of their friendship. Um, and John Quincy Adams, as he, he was just a boy, but, uh, but I, think, I think they later in, in later life, John Adams recalled that John Quincy was as much Jefferson's son as his. I mean, John Quincy at the time just looked up to Jefferson immensely. So uh, both of those, those men, Adams and Franklin, really kind of eased the way, especially Franklin, you know, for Jefferson into, into Paris society. And they were both, uh, both older than him. So they both kind of showed him the ropes, so to speak. Um, and especially in financial matters, uh, John, I mean, I think Jefferson did pretty well for himself in terms of culture, could hold his own, but he had no head for money. And I mentioned Jefferson had to go to Amsterdam is because the American uh, loans were, America was gonna default on the loans. Our government was already defaulting back in the 1780s. Uh, we had taken out all these, these loans to pay for the debt and pay for government salaries uh, from Dutch bankers, private Dutch bankers. And they were calling in the loans and Jefferson had no idea what to do. Uh, but luckily, Adams came all the way from London and negotiated with the bankers and gave Jefferson time then to wander around and, you know, eat things and shop in Amsterdam. Um, we had another question about his landscaping. It says, did his love of landscaping spread to the other early settlers? Are there any gardens in the U.S. that he's directly related to? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I think um, I have even you know, read, you know, very indirectly that, you know, he has some kind of influence even on, on like Frederick Law Olmsted, just in terms of the idea of these kind of sweeping vistas and the, the contrast between fields, uh, the fields and woods. But Jefferson, uh, you, you know, he, he put some of his ideas in place in Monticello. He was not able to put all of them in place, uh, primarily for, for money issues. But uh, but if you if you go to Monticello, you'd see first of all you see a thousand foot long vegetable garden he has. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see what's called a folly, you know, a small little building that he had built, and, and he had he had what he called his grove, uh, where uh, he directed, of course, enslaved people, but to to thin out the woods, you know, cut out all the the underbrush so you could walk through. It's very hot in Virginia. As, as, you, as you know, and to walk through, you know, shade is our Elysium, he wrote. You could walk through this kind of, uh, this, the, the side of the mountain and he kept deer there. So he had all these ideas there for landscaping. He also put them into place uh, at the University of Virginia 
you know, which is, which is also uh, just has beautiful landscaping. He has this lawn, which originally now it's closed on one end. He has, you know, the main building on one end and it's now it's closed off by a class room building at the other. But his original idea was just this lawn would kind of stretch off uh, into the horizon and it's ringed by, uh, it's ringed by professors' houses, each one in a different architectural style. So he had a lot of ideas. He had, you know, put these ideas into his, his, uh, his second house, Poplar Forest, uh, that he spent a lot of time in retirement. So, um, uh, so he came, he came back with, uh, I think, I, I think it was, it was probably the premier, you know, landscaping, uh, landscape design in the country at the time. Um, someone asked, do you think his culinary tips are valid today? So Jefferson, um, so he popularized, he, he loved his French food, but the food served at the president's house was kind of a mix of French and Virginian. Um, that, that you know, I think it, se it seemed to really, it really pleased guests. He served, he famously served ice cream, uh, kind of ice cream in a puff pastry even. He popularized French fried potatoes. So he was just at the, I mean, <laughs> he, he, he's not, he's not obviously the first one to bring these foods to America, but but he certainly made them pos uh, you know, popular. There's a book you can get called Dining at Monticello where a modern day chef has taken the old recipes. There are some preserved in Jefferson's own hand and some others from a family cookbook that was used later in the Jefferson family. So they've taken those and they've updated it to kind of some modern ingredients you might be able to find, change the measurements and stuff like that. So it's kind of fun if you want to try out any of those recipes. That sounds great. I think I have one more question I can do. Uh, let's see, will we ever see an actual portrait of Jefferson or does he remain a myth by and large? A portrait of Jefferson. In the portrait, I think what they mean is the, the biography of him. Will we ever- Oh. Will, will we see him as a myth or will we ever see him as a real man? Well, I mean, it is, it is difficult. I mean, that's that, you know, I call him, you know, the, you know, the most perplexing founding father, you know, in the title, you know, I was there, I was on this, uh, on this journey myself, I was learning about the places I went to, I was having my own experiences, and I was also trying to find out more about Jefferson. Um, and he can be contradictory. And he, you know, he, he raised up some barriers, maybe to truly knowing him. On the other hand, I think I got to see him more as as a man, uh, as a real person, because I was on, on this trip, I was literally following him from place to place. I saw where he got lost, where he thought he was going somewhere. It's like, oh no, you shouldn't have turned off there. You know, he had he had breakdowns on the road. He had, you know, any, any problems anybody else would have out there. So I think, I think I particularly really kind of saw him more as a real person, especially when I was in those real small little villages and towns way out of the way, you know, a town in France that had 500 people in Jefferson's town and probably a similar amount today, just thinking, wow, you know, you, you can really kind of peel back the layers and see those connections. And, and that's, yeah. you know, he was, he was just right there. So um, I got as close as I'm going to get to understanding him anyway. It's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, just everyone remember Barrett Bookstore has the book on their shelves. And if you were a winner tonight, uh, connect with Derek's website for your winnings. And let me, we're, as I said, we have only a picture of the book cover since the books are out. It has a nice book cover. And once again, thank you so much. It's fascinating. And I'm sure everyone really enjoyed it. I'll see you again for your next book, I hope. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate All right. It. Good night, everyone. See you.